Good evening. My name is KV Sane. I'm the uh, director of the Contemporary Theater Studies Program here at Shepherd University, and I am thrilled to welcome you all to this evening's dialogue and celebration of Dance We Do. Ed, would you like to introduce yourself to the room? Hi, good evening. My name is Ed Herendine, and I'm the producing director for the Contemporary American Theater Festival. We wanted to just uh, meet with you today for just a moment before we begin the evening's events, uh, just to thank everyone for their support. Um, I, of course, uh, need to thank the Contemporary American Theater Festival and our colleagues and our staff members there who have worked with us here in the theater program at Shepherd to bring this event to life. Um, I also want to just acknowledge Professor Charlotte, who did write the afterword to this text, um, and we're very, very, very pleased to find the way of partnering with the Unmuted series to, to honor this this work. And uh, KB, it's it's a real pleasure and a thrill to be able to um, collaborate with the Theater Festival and Shepherd University Theater and with Professors KB Sane and um, Professor um, Renee Charlot. So we're thrilled and honored to be able to be with you tonight to celebrate Dance We Do by N. Tazaki Shange. And um, we just are looking forward to a groundbreaking conversation tonight. And again, celebrating the collaboration and the partnership between a professional theater and the theater at Shepherd University. We're thrilled to be together, to collaborate with one another. And most importantly, KB, we're thrilled to welcome everybody into our Unmuted series. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Ed. Um, again, I just want to celebrate the a tremendous opportunity that, of course, we have as faculty members, but also that our students have for being able to be present and part of all of these events and activities that we share with you at CATF. So thank you so much. I think we're going to move forward without further ado. So thank you, Ed, very much. And we're going to send you away. And I'm going to talk to the audience for just a second, and then we'll move forward. Um, I wanted to take a moment to set up what the evening's event would be about and would be like. The name of the book is Dance We Do. The subtitle is A Poet Explores Black Dance. And one of the things that most people don't recognize about Ntozaki is that she really was quite a dancer in her career and in her own right. And I thought it would be really interesting to share with you um, a clip that we have access to that is Ntozaki reading from this text, uh, just to give you a sense of who she is, for those of you who didn't have the joy of knowing her, um, to hear her voice and to uh, get a sense of why she thought black dance was so important. So we're gonna have just a moment of a video and you can, can share in her sharing of this text, a very early draft. But black people have been singing and dancing ever since we got here. We have been associated with singing and dancing and entertaining white people since we got here. We were enslaved to entertain white people and work the fields. To realize one has a body and to feel that body in motion, flying, stomping, sweating, sliding, turning, cascading in somersaults, or crossing the floor in the Grand Chasse or Grand Batmans is to know freedom. I discovered my, late, my body late in life for a dancer, but I have been dancing all of my life. Whatever black people did with our behinds and our feet, I tried since I could walk. My mother said I took after my great aunt Marie, who cut off her tresses in the roaring 20s and wore patent leather shoes to a funeral that shocked Augusta, Georgia. I just wiggled and shamed everybody, just like Marie. I could have been hers. But it was Catherine Dunham and her exquisite care for the black body that saved me from my wildness in the arbitrary forms of black vernacular dance that came so easily to all of us, but left no trace of our his history from one generation to the next. From Haiti to Detroit, the black people danced. Dunham found a technique in our movement. She found our discipline that we had never named in our limbs and our feet and our necks and our torsos. Contracting, extending, challenging rhythm with every beat. I found by chance teachers and compatriots who were also descendants of the Dunham technique and of the diaspora. Without discussion, without so much as a word, we shared this power and this beauty. 
What a great treat to get to share that. Um, we owe a special debt of gratitude to the Africana Studies Program at Bernard College for allowing us to share some of that footage with you. It is from a lecture that they held, uh, I think, two years ago now. Um, so thank you to our colleagues at Bernard College. At this time, I'm ready to turn the program over to the people who really have something to say. I'd like to introduce you to a dear colleague and friend of mine, uh, Lori Go. Lori is a choreographer and dancer that I have known for many years. Um, she is part of Catherine Dunham's legacy, and I know that you heard Ntozaki speak of Dunham earlier today. Um, I asked Lori to join us for this uh, because you'll meet Professor Charlo as well. But years ago, Professor Charlo and Ntozaki came out to visit us. Uh, and to do a conversation for our little small town in West Virginia. And Lori and I were able to create a presentation that didn't just speak to who Ntozaki was as a woman and as an artist, but we were able to stage a number of her pieces. Uh, we did a bit from Spell Number no. 7 and a bit from Lost in Language and Sound. And I directed um, two beautiful young actresses to speak the speech, and uh, Lori had a full a uh, roster of drummers and dancers and led some choreography to the work and I can still in my mind's eye picture Intozaki with her hands in the air clapping and the look of joy on her face from it um, and to me that always brings me joy and so it's my great honor to welcome Lori to join us and Lori I'm gonna hand it to you take it away. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction and uh, thank you to Shepard um, and to Bernard, and uh, I'm honored. It's an honor and a privilege to be in the room with um, such wonderful scholars and artists. And um, I'd like to welcome everyone that's on uh, the call with us tonight. And I'm sure that you're going to be um, thoroughly enlightened, and we're going to learn some things about. Um, our dear ancestor, Ntozaki Sangye, that uh, maybe we didn't know about her. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our uh, first panelist. Um, our first panelist, Renee L. Charlo, is an actress, director, writer, and visual artist. She is an adjunct professor of theater at Shepherd University and an adjunct professor of literature at Southern New Hampshire University. Renee was the personal assistant to Ntozaki Shange from 2014 to 2018. She served as an associate producer and assistant director for the production of Shange's Lost in Language and Sound at Paramu House and directed full productions for colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough at both Virginia Commonwealth University, Richmond, Virginia, and Bowie State University, Bowie, Maryland. She earned a master's in creative art therapy at Pratt Institute with a thesis, with the thesis, I found God in myself too, an ethnographic examination of the writing of Ntozaki Shange. Welcome. Thank you so much for being on this panel, Renee, Dr. Renee. Okay. Next to the panel, I'd like to welcome Dr. Halifu Osumare, who is a professor emerita in African American and African Studies at the <clears throat> University of California, Davis, and has been a dancer, choreographer, and cultural activist for over 40 years. She is recognized for her books, The Africanist Aesthetic in Global Hip Hop, Power Moves, and The Hip Life in Ghana. West African in indigenation of hip hop. <clears throat> As a dancer, she was a soloist with the Rod Rogers Dance Company of New York in the early 70s and is a certified Dunham Technique instructor. As a community activist, she was the founder of City Center Dance Theater in Oakland and created the Black Choreographers Moving Toward the 21st Century Initiative for Experimental Black Choreographers 
in the late 80s and the early 90s. She recently published her autobiography, Dancing in Blackness, a memoir. Like her mentor, Catherine Dunham, she has dedicated her life to the intersections of the arts and humanities for a better world. Please welcome Dr. Halifu Osamari to the panel. Next and finally, uh, we welcome Diane McIntyre. Diane McIntyre is a dancer, choreographer, and director whose Harlem-based company, Sounds in Motion, was founded in 1972 and who creates works for concert dance, Broadway, regional, theater, and film. Her choreographic screen credits include Beloved and Miss Evers' Boys, Emmy Award nomination. Among her honors are a Doris Duke Artist Award, a Guggenheim Fellowship, honorary Doctor of Fine Arts degrees from State University of New York at Purchase and Cleveland State University, and numerous grants. She collaborated and choreographed with Ntozaki Shange on many projects, including Spell Number no. 7, Boogie Woogie Landscapes, Why I Had to Dance, Lost in Language and Sound, and It Hasn't Always Been This Way. Please welcome our distinguished panelists to this uh, event. We're glad to be here. Yes, very happy to be with you. Thank you. There's so many heavyweights in the pan on the panel. Y'all made me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> don't be nervous. No, don't Thinking be nervous. Like I have to exit an interstage right or something. <laughs> we're, we're, we're all sisters just talking. Yes, we are. Yes. yes. OK. Well, I'd like to, um, I'd like to start with um, you, Renee, mm -hmm. um, since you um, work so closely um, with Ntozaki. And um, I wanted to ask, um, how did you meet and begin working together? Um, a friend of mine, <clears throat> his name is Eric McMillan. He did a tribute to For Colored Girls. It was the, I wanna say the 50th anniversary of it on Broadway. So Erish needed someone to assist him uh, with Ntozaki in terms of making certain she got from point A to point B. So I went up to New York and assisted him backstage with uh, working with her. And I was just so honored and just, just enamored by her. So after that event, her family needed someone to travel with her from New York back here to the DC area. So I rode the train back with her and I told them, I said, if you all want me to travel with her or accompany her on other trips, please let me know. Little did I know that would come to light quicker than I thought it would, because she th there was an art exhibit that was done in New York um, at um, I forget the I forget the theater I forget the um, where it was done, and they needed someone to travel with her, so we went up to New York. I stayed with her a couple of days, and I traveled with her, and I made certain that she got everywhere she needed to go. So when we would come back to DC, we started working and writing together. And I started taking her to di different places here in um, the DC area, different plays and different shows. So we started working and writing and I started traveling with her. I traveled to Cleveland with her as we worked on Lost in Language and Sound. And it was just a wonderful experience. So when, when it came time for her to work on this book again, and initially the idea was for her to hire a student. And I said, well, no, I'll help her with this because I didn't, honestly, I didn't trust anyone to handle it properly. So I would, I would take three days a week and go over to her house and just help her type and write. She would dictate and I would just sit and listen to these wonderful stories. So I was able to travel with her, work with her and hear all these wonderful stories and I did that from 2014 until her transition in um, 2018. Oh, 
So it was just a wonderful experience for me. And we yeah, and we traveled to Davis and Elkins and where I met you. That was so wonderful. That was that was such um, an unbelievable uh, you know event in my mm -hmm. life. You know, I didn't I didn't expect um, all that she gave. Um, you know her as her as a novelist right. um, and playwright. What was it like getting to know her as a dancer? She told me once that she found a way through the choreo poem to marry her two favorite forms of art. That was dance and poetry. Oh. And just listening to her talk about dancing with Halifu, dancing with Diane, auditioning for Diane, and just dancing with Fred Benjamin and dancing in different shows. It was just amazing because much like everyone else, I knew of the Intazaki Shange that wrote for colored girls and wrote her other works, but I didn't know of this dancer. And she was a wonderful dancer. We would get in the car to go somewhere sometimes and she wanted, she loved this Latino music, the salsa music, turn that up, turn that up. So we would be in the car and she would just, when she found out how to work the volume in my car, I was in trouble because she would cut it up real loud. And we'd be riding down the street listening to their music and she loved it. She loved it. She was just enamored with dance. And I think I heard Halifu say this. She was as good a dancer as she was a writer. She was just as adept in both. Uh -huh. And those dance stories, man, they were amazing. Wow. Um, you mentioned um, the term that she coined choreo poem yeah talk about um when that came about and how that came about now she uh for colored girls was on broadway in 1975 and i had to go back to make certain as i pass out information it's 100 percent accurate so i'm going to thank my brother um brother neil um lester for what i'm about to state her poems were specifically about the lives of black and brown people and the challenges writers of color face. But the choreo poem transcends race and gender boundaries and comments on the reality of human experiences. And she said that she made it up because she knew she wasn't a playwright. Her relationship with theater developed as a poet and a dancer. It did not develop as a person who was an actress or who was involved in theater or the conventions of theater as we know them. And she felt that as a second generation person of the black arts movement, she was very concerned and passionate. And she was committed to the idea of creating new rituals and new mythologies for people of color. So you take dance, you take poetry, here's the choreo poem. Laurie, I have something to say about that. Okay. Um, yes, um, it, it, I think it's important to note that um, uh, her bringing together these two art forms that she loved so much um, was a process that she was developing in, uh, in the Bay Area on the West Coast, in San Francisco and in Oakland. Because after she had left Barnard and her um, undergraduate degree, she went to Southern California to, um, uh, what is it? Uh, I forget the name of the university, not UCLA. USC. Um, USC. Yeah, USC. Yep. To get her master's in American studies. And during that time when she was working on her master's, she would come up to Northern California to the San Francisco, Oakland Bay Area, which is my, my home area. And she became a part of the Black Arts Movement West that was very much flourishing um, in um, San Francisco and Oakland during that time. Amiri Baraka and Sonia Sanchez and others had come to the West Coast mm -hmm. and had organized uh, Black artists to, uh, to kind of replicate the same thing that was going on on the East Coast. So she immediately got involved with that, with that crew. And um, I remember the first time I, I realized who she was and that she was a part of our art scene in the Bay Area was when she put together a radio show 
um, on a, a public radio station called K Poo. And her so show is called what? the K Poo. K P O O. Okay. And and um she her show was called The Original Aboriginal Dancing Girl. So <laughs> yep. so that 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 right there, the name of her show really shows the way in which she identified mm -hmm. herself to us and the community. She identified us herself as a a, a multidisciplinary artist um, who uh, read her poetry on air and she played, as Renee was saying, lots of salsa music, lots of Afro beat from West Africa, R&B, she was into it all. Mm -hmm. wow. And so um, uh, it was her taking, beginning to take my dance classes um, and working in my productions, uh, one of which was called The Evolution of Black Dance, where I was exploring um, the development of Black dance from African dance through uh, African-American social dance. Mm -hmm. um, she be began to um, look at how I was putting together dance, uh, movement, the word, the written word, and into a full production. And she also performed in another production that I did, an actual play called Four Women, Images of the Black Woman in Monologue, Song, and Dance. So all of that experience was building in her as she was writing the poems for, for Colored Girls. And I can tell you right now, I heard those poems that were finally on Broadway, sometimes oh. two o'clock in the morning, where she would wake me up out of my a deep sleep to read me one of her poems that she had just written. So it's quite something to, to um, to see these poems now that have become mm -hmm. a part of mm -hmm. iconic American theater right. um, that I first heard over the telephone in the middle of the night, <laughs> that kind of thing. You know? But oh. she was she That's was always funny. iconoclastic, breaking yep. new ground, and okay. very in, uh, an intense artist. Yeah. And I loved her, and she uh, gave me my name. I'm Halifu Osamari <laughs> because of her. Yes. So I, I, I have a lot more to say, but I'll leave it there for right okay. now because that tells part of the story about how she began to understand the development of the choreo poem through dancing, being in other productions and seeing how she was gonna work that into her own poetry. Into her own poetry. Yeah. Um, Diane, um, I, I feel um, awkward even though I'm, I said, you're not supposed to tell your age, but you know, I'm 58. I feel awkward addressing you as Diane. How would you like me to address you? Well, you can call me Miss Diane like you did earlier. Okay. Uh, some people are, have started doing that in recent years. Okay. I know, okay. I know that Miss Dunham, probably from when she was a young, a much younger person, mm -hmm. you had to address her as Miss Dunham. Right. I think that maybe even the people who might have been even close to her age. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My mentor, uh, Tommy Gomez, you know, he had that little mustache. Yes. We call her Miss D. Miss <laughs> D. <laughs> wow. I didn't get to call her Miss D, but I did call her Miss mm. D. Yeah. I, um, I wanted to ask you, um, you're the first woman in Ntozaki's in, uh, interviewed um, and recalled in the book, Dance We Do, subtitled, A Poet Explores Black Dance. Ntozaki talked with you about the evolution of, choreogra of your choreographic work and how it related to Black music and Black influences. So how has being a black woman in um, the arts, how has that influenced your choreography? Wow, okay. <laughs> that's a big that's a big question. All Take right. All the time you need, I'm listening. <laughs> okay. So I will have to say that I I grew up at, in Cleveland, Ohio, moved to New York in 1970. And 
even though I had my training, I had my training in dance as a little girl with a black ballet teacher in Cleveland, Elaine Gibbs Redman. And so, and I didn't miss that there were not white people in our classes, uh -huh. even though I went to school with uh, other white students. So that was, uh, and then I, we had our dances. We had a thing called the center every Friday night. And even though we were in what you call a, an integrated school system, every Friday night at the center, at the school, there were only black people there. We just danced and some of the singing groups sang and everybody danced. Mm -hmm. We did the latest dances. So my growing up was a merger of my training and then the dances we did for fun. We made up dances. And then I went to Ohio State University where I was a dance major. And though I was a dance major in a more Eurocentric centered modern dance tradition, when I was allowed to, or not allowed to, when we got to the point where we were going to choreograph our own studies, my own background came into that. Okay. I, remember I did a piece called, there was this musical, working in the coal mine, going down, down. You all remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. So one of my final studies in school was that. Oh. I, I found nothing, uh, even though there were no other black people in the class, uh -huh. it was just inside of me. So when I came to New York City in 1970, I just immersed myself in the theater, in the dance, in the, it was, it was the era of the black arts movement as Halifu spoke about. It was just on the edge of it. Like I like you say the second generation of the yeah. black arts movement. So maybe that's when people ask me, weren't you part of the black arts movement? I like, no, that was before me. But I can say I was in the second generation of that. So uh, it, it was where I, we were a people during that time where whatever you were creating, it was for black consciousness. Yes. If you are a visual artist, yep. if you are a dancer, if you are a musician, if you are a poet, whatever you were doing was for black consciousness, for the upliftment of our people, for the education of everyone about who we were mm -hmm. and for inspiring. Yes, move forward. Don't let anything hold you back. So when I met Ntozaki Shange, I met her as a dancer because she came to audition for my company and my studentship to be either a scholarship student or a, a dance company member. She had recently come from the West Coast. I didn't know that at the time. And she was always with her buddy in class whose name is Paula Moss. And Paula, she and Paula were tight like this. And they had both, like um, Halifu said, they had done quite a lot of merging together of the dance and the poetry in the Bay Area before they both came across country to New York. So I knew both of them in class as beautiful dancers. They both got scholarships. And I'm like, yes, Ntozaki will just fly across the floor. Oh my goodness. She was the most eager. Don't you find that, Halifu? Yes, but most just, definitely. A you, sponge. A sponge. A sponge. You say, lift that arm a little more. Oh, that, she going to lift it all the way up. How low can you go? She's going to go all the way down. I'm going to give you her. She said she started that formal training a little bit later than some people. So maybe to make up for it, she was giving it her all. Yeah. And that because of that, she stood out in the class. Even some people may have had longer training than she had, but she would stand out in the class because of her eagerness, her passion, her love for dance. And so when I found out that she also wrote poetry, <laughs> I'm telling you, I knew her as a dancer. I'm like, what? 
somebody showed me some of these poems that became for colored girls. I, I'm like, what? In the Zaki wrote that I can't believe that because I know her as a dancer. And the and the poems were so unique, so exceptional that I thought her like little Intozaki. <laughs> Little Intozaki, the dancer who just gives her art. I'm like, she's writing these fierce poems. Oh my goodness. So then over time, actually uh, working with her poetry and some of her production is really uh, a, a, was really a godsend. And also it spoiled me because it was words of that level not of that level, her word spoiled me in terms of working with other uh, written word. <laughs> I wanted to ask, um, I wanted to ask you, uh, Dr. Halifu and, and um, Ms. Diane, um, when you see dancers choreographing to written word, and it's, um, it's almost like a, um, a pantomime of the word. Mm -hmm. How how was choreographing um, to to Intizaki's words more? Um, how was that different to to be inspired by how she wrote and how to transfer that into movement? Well, uh, I, I don't think that most uh, dance artists are trying to pantomime exactly what the words are trying to say. Uh -huh. They're trying to get into uh, the depth of the meaning and the feeling of the word uh -huh. and, to bring, and to bring that out. And definitely in Tezaki's uh, poetry in the rhythm of it is naturally lends itself to dance and to movement. So, um, uh, I think that most dancers who had ha, has improvised to her work, which I have, and I know um, Diane uh, Harvey has, and and many other dancers have have uh, that she has gathered into her fold when she does poetry readings, that we try to illuminate the deeper meanings of the word, and not necessarily just do a, a word for movement pantomime. That's not. That's not the choreo uh, poem approach. It is about getting into the feeling, into the depth, into the rhythm of uh, the way the word and the movement works together and just let it flow. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. let it flow and allow, and allow that, that deeper meaning uh, to come out. There's a magic that happens when you get uh, poetry, like, like uh, Diane was saying that that is so deep in the way, in the in imagery that the way Intozaki writes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then you add movement that has a sense of that equal artistry. And you put those two together and you create magic. And that's what I always try to do. And uh, um, a lot of times at the, at, at, when she would finish the poem, I would finish the movement, I was in another world. Yeah. I was in a, another world and I'd have to kind of do a, do some breathing, bring myself back <laughs> and wait for the next poem. <laughs> yes. Wow. Yeah. yes. Uh, Diane, I remember <laughs> when you brought, when we were in um, Cleveland, you told those dancers that when we were in rehearsal, you mm. were like, feel the words, mm. let the words let the words get into your body. I remember that. And they had to take pause and listen. And we had to go over the words again and again and again so they could feel the words. I, re I remember that. Yes. Yeah. And uh, one other point, I agree completely with everything Halifu says. And Intazaki has actually said it. I'm not going to quote her exactly she has said something about how the dance and the poetry connect because it's like where the word ends the dance, the dance, the dance can complete the sentence. Okay, the dance can complete, it's not at all 
a, a, a mime because it's as if without in a, in a in a true choreo poem and a true collaboration in terms of the spontaneity if the dance was not there you wouldn't get the whole experience of the poem mm -hmm. you can still read her words on paper yeah. however her thing was the choreo poem and so the you as a choreographer, say if you were working on something that was set, that was going to be performed uh, perhaps almost the same way every time, you go deep into that poem and you see, do you dare to add this particular move, add this particular move because that particular move is going to have a comment Mm -hmm. on the word oh. when you get to know her very well then you know that comment that you're making on movement in movement is oh. fine with her. right holly Fu? yes for sure it's you fine know, it's, it's where, where, it's where fine. the word leaves off the movement begins and vice yes. versa you know That's and it was um it was like i said the the word i always like to use is magic you know when when um, the, they they came together in that in that form, and um, because she was a dancer, she she wrote in a way that just inherently had movement within it. So as we who were actually using our bodies to interpret her poem at some of her readings, it was very easy because the movement was already inherent in 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 the the, the phrasing and the way that the the uh, the uh, poem was written. Mm -hmm. So if you're miming the poem, it's like it is if you're miming a poem, it's just flat. Yeah. So what? Mm -hmm. yeah. You're there. You don't have to be there. Mm -hmm. We could just we could just listen to the to the poet. Because the poet will can be doing movement herself. Along with the words. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh -huh. And sometimes we do that too. Sometimes a person is actually speaking and sometimes the person who is the dancer is also speaking in Intazaka's uh -huh. work. Uh -huh. They are speaking the poem and dancing uh -huh. at the same time. So the roles were, it was flowing through words yeah. and movement. Yeah. It could go either way. Interesting. Um, Dr. Halifu, I wanted to ask you about um, uh, your interview with Ntozaki. You state that Catherine Dunham is your main influence. Um, could you talk about the Dunham technique and what you find most inspiring? And one more thing, in your work with Ntozaki, how did the Dunham technique translate or did it to any of the um, movement in your work with her? Well, um, uh, for those people who don't really know, we've been mentioning this woman's name and um, Intozaki uh, gives her a lot of credit in, uh, in, in this book, including, you know, a photo of, yes, of Ms. Dunham. Ms. Dunham is, is, is really the beginning of, um, uh, a kind of formalized uh, black dance technique in the United States. After her 1930s um, uh, uh, anthropology field work that she did out of the uh, University of Chicago, where she was looking at the dance of uh, African descendant people in the Caribbean, she began to formulate uh, a, a technique that she brought back to the United States and she developed on her dance company members like Tommy Gomez and Lucille Ellis and Callie Beatty and others that you studied with. Mm -hmm. So um, um, she is the beginning for us in terms of that formalization of, of uh, a black dance technique that is codified that can be passed down from one generation to the next. Now I am fourth generation Dunham certified instructor and, um, 
as I'm teaching others, they will become the fifth generation. So uh, it, it is definitely something that is passed down. Um, but the movements that are central to Dunham technique, isolation of the torso with the head, the shoulders, mm -hmm. the rib cage, mm -hmm. the hips, you know, all of yeah. that is inherent <laughs> already in, in African derived dance. Mm -hmm. um, and is what I was talking about in my um, lecture demonstration that I mentioned earlier, the evolution of black dance. So, but what she did was codify it. And of course she added her own inimitable style and uh, the, her, uh, her work in modern and in ballet. So mm -hmm. when we're using um, our movement, if we come through Ms. Dunham, that language already is there and comes through what it is that we choreograph. And um, when I was teaching my dance classes and Tazaki was taking my classes, she was learning Dunham technique because that is the, that is the foundation of what um, I was I was based in, and I really appreciated um, being able to be that conduit to pass on that legacy. And Intazaki received it. She learned it from others like Raymond Sawyer, another dancer that she talks about from uh, the uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. He had he had actually dance in the Dunham Company. So she got it from many different places. And um, if you, as you know, from studying with some of her company members, if you uh, come through that Dunham technique, it is always with you. It is always a part of your embodied knowledge. Yes. Yes, thank you for that. Um, you mentioned um, other dancers and Renee, I know that um, in the uh, afterward that you wrote, um, you stated that the book was not entirely complete. And um, Ntozaki had other people that she wanted to interview. And I wanted to know if you would like to speak about uh, some of the other dancers that um, she, you know, wanted to honor. Well, um, when I met Ntozaki, parts of the book had already been written. And I sat in on a couple of the interviews. Halifu's interview was on the phone and I recorded it. Um, uh, Cam Camille Brown, I sat in on that interview and I sat in on the interview with David Lois Ferron. Um, we were about to travel to go see other dancers to watch their process and for Ntozaki to interview them at the time of her transition. So the people who I mentioned in my afterword, I mentioned them because it's not that they were overlooked. It's just that Intozaki transitioned before we could get a chance to work with them. And I'll take a moment here and go on and say and speak their names because I just think it's real important that they get their recognition in this. George Faison. Jawale Willa Jo Zolar, Bill T. Jones, and I always mispronounce her name. Help me out, ladies. Amania Payne, is that correct? Correct. Amania. Amania Payne. Amania Payne. Stanzi Peterson, Chuck Davis, Tito Sampra, Oqui, Devon Doan, Laura Mill Machado, and Anna Glass and other dancers such as Camille Brown, David Lewis Ferron, and Diane Harvey were interviewed, but their personal portraits remained incomplete. And dance was just so important to Intozaki. And this book was very important to her as well. And that's why we, we didn't want to just go in, the publishers didn't want to just go in after she transitioned and just interview those people because it was very important that this book remain in her voice. That was the utmost of the utmost importance. So yes, I thank you for allowing me to mention those people who did not get profiled in the book. Because if we think about it, everyone, this is one of the only books about this many black dancers. There are black dancers and there are books about black dancers. Halifu has a book about black dance. 
but there needs to be more literature about black dance and about the lives and work of black dancers. And that's where, that's why in my head, dance we do is so important to the conversation. Thank you for that. Um, and excuse me, I want to just interject one person whose name, I think you forgot to mention him, but his, his profile was not in the book because he transitioned before. Before, right. He transitioned Donald, when we were heading to go um, interview him. Donald McHale. That's very mm -hmm. true. Donald yeah. McHale passed away. We were on, heading up there to interview him when that happened. Yeah. He uh, passed away on the day that she was scheduled to interview him. Yes. Wow. Donald McHale. Yeah. Yeah. Another of our great dance masters. Most definitely. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, Donald McHale, he, he, he was and is a master. And mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, he, he was at UC Irvine um, in, in his latter years and uh, as a full professor and also ran the department. Uh, but um, his, his, his choreography are classics. Yes. You know, Rainbow Round My Shoulder Rainbow is like, is like, is, yeah. is like, is like revelations, you know? Yes. <laughs> So, so uh, you know, his he he definitely his name should be should be mentioned, and I would have loved to have seen what she would have done with a chapter on him. Yes, his name is in there. It is in there, isn't it? Right. I, uh, I'll I'll look while we're while you ladies are continuing <laughs> to talk. I, I, I'll I, look again. I, I think you put his so, name. So um, when I I got I had the the privilege of meeting. In Tazaki in West Virginia, and then again when um, Black Theater Network had their conference in Chicago, um, and what a sense of humor she had me in stitches so I much. Know. Yeah, like, you know how when you laugh and your stomach just hurt and you just say, "Please stop," because I can't <laughs> take it anymore. <laughs> she was so uh, hilarious. Um, and some people she would talk about and they wouldn't get it until, you know, three days later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. I yeah. She, she definitely did have a, a, a really um, great wit and sense of humor. And, yeah. and she incorporated that into her readings and things that she would say in between her poems and the context that she would give her poems. I, I um, Diane, to, to, to your question, this is the uh, this is that free copy I had. So his name isn't in this one, but I think it's in the official copy. So yeah, I've yeah. seen it in the official copy. This was the uh, like the galley copy that they sent. Okay, uh, yeah, you got it. it. You got yeah. it in the official copy. In the official, right? Because <laughs> I remember you told me it needed to be in there. So. <laughs> yes. Um, so, and Lori, I do want to add this, the book as it is now never would not, it never would have been finished had it not been not just for these two ladies on this call, but several other people who I would ask, and I would ask for information and they supported us as we did this work, this very important work. Like Mickey Davidson. Like Mickey Davidson. Yes, another choreographer work. Definitely. Like Diane um Diane Har Harvey. Diane mm -hmm. Harvey Salam. Oh yes. Um Camille. They they were when I would call on them and say, I need this, I need this, I need this. I had it. And the um the uh glossary terms, that's because of these ladies and Mickey Davidson. So I want to make certain I give them their flowers while they can enjoy it. Thank you. Hey, yeah, it, uh, we had to do it for our sister because yeah. this was her this was her last uh, major effort uh, before she left us. And um, we, we had to make sure that this got out and it got out with integrity and um, the right information. Because as you said, uh, Renee, um, a lot of these uh, artists, a lot of people haven't heard of. But yeah. she wanted to make sure that she gave credit to all the people who inspired her in dance. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, it's, yeah. it's so important for the for the um, for us to to 
give honor not just to the the elders whose you know shoulders we stand on, but anyone that um, was an influence in your creative you know process. Um, and sometimes some some of um, the people that you work with kind of you know uh, don't follow through on that. So um, I thank you for for doing this for her and for um, the young artists, writers, and dancers that are to come. You know they have this they have this yes. on top of the the other body of work that exists. Um, I wanted, I was talking about her humor and I wanted to ask you if you had a specific story that you could share, something that's not in the book, but um, something that spoke to just something that was just hilarious or, you know, that brought you joy, a story that you have to tell us. The, well, I'll go first because okay. the biggest story that I have we were in New York in a hotel room in New York. Uh, we were in Manhattan, and um, I was in I was in bed. I, she had she was in the bedroom, and I don't I think we were in a suite, and I was in a pullout bed. And as we all know, Intizaki Shange loved her Pepsi's, and she loved her smokes. So at two in the morning, I'm asleep and I see this figure moving in the room and I'm like, what on earth? What's going on? Is some, did somebody break in the room? No, it was Intazaki Shange with her cane heading out of the door. And I'm like, so where are you going? Where are you going? I'm going outside for a minute. So I had to get up, put my coat on and go outside with her because she wasn't taking no for an answer. And another story that comes to my mind, I took her to a show here in DC. I took her to see um, uh, one of Katori Hall's plays down at Arena Stage. And when we pulled up, she was like, I don't want anybody to recognize me. I said, we're going to a theater. What do you think is going to happen? I said, you're in Zaki Shange. You really think we're going to walk in a um, regional theater in Washington, DC? at a black play and nobody's gonna recognize you. I don't want anybody to know who I am. And I'm like, okay, good luck with that. So we, I, took, uh, I dropped her off and I went and parked the car and I came back. And when we got to our seat, a man and a woman were standing there and they were like, hi, Aunt Zaki, hi, good to meet you. And she didn't know who they were. They were just fans. And she was like, how did they see me in this dark theater? I'm like, you're into Zaki Shange. <laughs> what do you think? So she, she, believe it or not, as flamboyant as she was and as full of life as she was, there were times when she just liked her space and she just liked not, she didn't like people fussing over her a lot, a lot, a lot. I, I saw sides of that sometimes. So those are two of my funniest stories about her. And then the Pepsi runs were just, she should have owned stock in Pepsi. That's all I can say. The only <laughs> photo I have with her, there's, de there's a Pepsi bottle on the table. Yeah, there you <laughs> so you, what you say is true. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I, I, this is not a funny story, but it goes to something Renee and I could tell this together because she was the director of her own piece, um, Lost in Language and Sound, in Cleveland at Caramel Theater, which is the oldest African-American ongoing theater center in the country, started in 1915. After the production, which went very well, Renee told me this story because I wasn't right in the, right in the room at the time, but Renee, you could tell it how people were coming up to Zaki because there was a reception afterwards. Mm -hmm. People were coming up. They were bowing to her. Oh, yeah. They were at her feet. Yeah. They were, they were, they were just giving her all praises. People oh, yeah. of all different ages. Some of them were children. Oh, yeah. And she turned to Renee and said, why, why are they, what is all the fuss? Why are they doing this? Yeah. 
That's not a funny story. That's who she. Yeah, that's who she was. A yeah, girl. It actually shows I, her. It, it shows her how uh, how uh, humble she was. She had humble. a lot of humility. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, you know, she was just passionate about creating. Yes. Yeah. But you know, all the, the the celebrity and things that went along with it. You know, she she could she could leave that. But yeah. it, it was it was the work. That's what she was really into. The work yeah, yeah. of producing her visions, her her sense of what our lives are all about right, and right. the meaning behind them. That's was her motivation. It wasn't about the acclaim and right. the uh, the celebrity. Yes. Yes. She, she always said her job was to say what she saw. And that's what she did. Halitha was 100% right. I've seen people get on their knees and cry and tell her how for Colored Girls or another piece she wrote changed their lives and yes. how much it meant to them. I mean, and she was gracious while they were there, but I could see sometimes the discomfort on her face. You know, but yes. she was, she did it because she wanted to leave stories and tell the stories of Black and Brown people. Right. That's what she did it for. It was certainly not for the acclaim that she did receive. Yes. And and at Barnard, when I in 2010, I think I visited, I was uh, helping with some workshops with the mm -hmm. students at Barnard who were honoring her there. Wow. And the people, the students were telling stories about how she had changed their lives. I don't, at first she wasn't in, in the room. These students were all different backgrounds. They were all, even some of them were not even from the United States. They were not, all of them were not brown people. In fact, mm -hmm. most of them were not. Mm -hmm. And the, her work had completely transformed their lives as women going forward in the world. Mm -hmm. So her work had no bounds, no boundaries. Oh, we're supposed to be telling some funny stories. <laughs> well, uh, I, 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 I just have this one. Um, uh, the last time I saw Indazaki was five months before she passed. And that was in New York, uh, May, I think it was actually May 18th, mm -hmm. um, uh, 2018. Yeah. Renee, Renee brought her there for a joint reading with me. I was doing a, a talk at Hunter College with my uh, my memoir, Dancing in Blackness, which she's all up in uh, several of the chapters. And she was uh, presenting um, her book of uh, her last major book of poetry, Wild Beauty. Mm -hmm. And um, first I did my reading and then I brought her up to do her reading. And when she got up there, she read a poem about a fictitious relationship with Barb Marley. Uh, it was, she, he, he was her husband, her yeah. lover, her, yeah. and, and the way in which she, uh, the, the, the poem was written and, and the way that she talked about her relationship with Barb Marley, the whole audience was just in stitches. The poem itself just cracked them up, but she had that kind of uh, uh, sense of humor that she could put into her poetry. And if she wanted to make a humorous poem, she was a master at it. Yeah. And uh, that, um, I'll never forget that. I was, I, I, I was really, really noticing how much her, her wit and her humor was so much a part of, of, of her aesthetic and how she yeah. could, you know, she, she could just take an audience and, and, and have them in stitches, just cracking up. Yeah. <laughs> Even uh, the video that was shown at the beginning, that short excerpt in the video, she said a number of funny things in there. Mm -hmm. One, the audience laughed. The other time, I don't think they got it because mm -hmm. she's saying it with a straight face. That would, yeah. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and that was part of her humor. She yeah. it would be like uh, dry. You know, she would just be saying these things and they would be so funny, but she wouldn't be cracking up at all. She would just be like, well, this is just the way it is. Yeah. yeah. And she'd go on to the next sentence. Right. 
Right, but but that's what made it so funny is because she delivered her li the lines in such a, a matter of fact way. Yes, yes. She liked, um, yeah, she was a lover of life. Oh yeah, uh, lover of let, life. Ladies, oh. I'm re I don't know why, but I'm feeling this this urgent uh, feeling to. Uh, I wrote a I wrote something about. Uh, our, our relationship in the early days, and I and and in the the essay that I wrote that was published, it's called Early Zaki Memories. I I cre I use one of her poems, just a section of it. C could I just read part of it? Read her poem, of please. Uh, it's it's called um, I I'm a poet who. Okay. I'm a poet who. I don't want to write in English or Spanish. <clears throat> like the bata dance scream, twitch hips with me cause don't for, done forget all about words, ain't got no definitions. I want to whirl with you. Mm. Our whole body on the corner in the park where the rug used to be. Let Willie Colon take you out, swing your head, push your legs to the moon with me. That's just part of it. Okay. Wow. Nice. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's in Dazaki. Yeah. And that's how she wove dance into her her uh, poems. Um, the movement was there, and she was dancing as she was writing. Mm -hmm. Yes, she said the dance helped her write. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I remember. Um, uh, her talking about the 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 way um, you began the dance class with the breath and um, how the words were like that, like breathing and, and uh, you know flowing through the elements of both dance and and writing that took um, time and space. Yes. Well, you know. Um, uh, Endozaki came to a rehearsal I had with some dancers from the Dance Theater of Harlem. So I choreographed a piece on them in 2015-16. And so she, uh, I invited her to rehearsal because it was my very first experience creating work on ballet dancers. And I was doing movement that was grounded and visceral and it was a little bit different from what they had done. They are brilliant dancers. I mean, absolutely brilliant. And I was uh, really taking them into some new territory for their own background. So uh, Zaki gave them notes. Okay, that's why she was there. <laughs> she gave them notes. She said, well, Diane, this, what you all are doing is like, it's not, that's not it. She said, this is not it. That's not what she's after. When you go to the side like that, she wants you to go za like that. Mm. She wants you to go za and wa and ta. So she said, do that dancers. <laughs> she, had them, she had them do the move. She said, do that movement again, but do it and say, sa, pa, ta. So, they did that. Ah, pa, ta. Next time I talked to her, I said, Zaki, we kept those sounds of the breath. We kept that in the piece. Wow. <laughs> we incorporated in the piece. Wow. Yeah, so. That's amazing. It's It's been, um, you know, uh, truly a pleasure for me. I feel like I should be uh, paying for a class or getting some college credit for this or something. <laughs> it's been wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing um, her work and your experiences with her and giving us an insight into her that we would not have had um, if not for you and your work. Um, thank you so much. And I think that um, we probably need to open up the 
uh, question and answer. If we have some participants that have questions for you or comments. I'm Hello, I just realized I'm still leaned in from just <laughs> listening to I, I, I really I feel like I've gone to artistic church and that I yeah, <laughs> have just taken a master class. Uh, thank you all so much for your your time and your energy and your stories. Um, we do have uh, quite a few questions. Actually, there was a lively chat happening uh, while you were going in. I want to acknowledge I don't know the names of the people who have asked the questions, but I want to acknowledge the comment that there isn't anything in Zaki's Wikipedia Wikipedia page about her being a dancer um, and that we will take that information to the people who should know it. So I just wanted to acknowledge uh, whoever that was. I saw it when it came through and um, we'll make sure to bring that up with, with her representation. Um, but there was a, a comment, um, actually this one is um, from Sabrina and she was in conversation, um, shout out to another great dancer, Jalinda Lewis, who was back and forth Jill. in this moment. Um, Jill, yay. <laughs> yeah, um, so uh, wait, I do also she's a, a wonderful human and a great dancer so Jalinda glad to glad to see that you were here um, but she was back and forth with Sabrina and I'm going to read this comment um, because it really does come from from the woman at, or the person asking the question um, and they stated Miss Diane's comment about the second generation of the black arts movement prompted my question Given the events of 2020, murder of George Floyd and other American and, and, and other African Americans, the heightened awareness of the issues impacting the black community and the reflection of America that was revealed in this recent election, do you believe that we are on the brink of a third generation for the raising of the black consciousness? Is there a purpose it would serve at this time, perhaps raising the consciousness of Americans overall? It occurs to me that this level of inspiration is certainly necessary. I wonder how to direct my voice at this time, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. And this actually then was echoed by other people in the chat. So I think the question is, do you believe that we're on the brink of a third generation for the raising of the black consciousness? Um, it seems like something like that is necessary, and, and to ask you all what your thoughts are about that. Is, is this a third wave? That is fascinating. Well, I'll start it and then you all can chime in. I'll start it because there have been many waves in between. This is not the third wave uh, for the people who've asked that. There have been quite a few waves between uh, the 1970s and today. The thing is that the, pe the younger people today creating, and even the people who are not as young, creating their work, their choreography today, their choreography is addressing these issues. They have been addressing the struggles or the consciousness or the questions that we've had about how we are not a unified society. Those have gone on throughout over time. However, today, the young people are creating choreography as if it is the dance of Black Lives Matters. It's happening right now. It's all on, we are in a period of COVID. However, these dances or, and the dance conversations are being created now. Some of them are creating them with film because it's, uh, we're on the not, so easy to get into theaters right now. And even before this period, it was coming forward. Nobody has ever stopped doing that. Yeah, uh, I, this I might be, Maybe this is the seventh or ninth. <laughs> well, I, 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 uh, in, 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 in looking at the, uh, the, the waves of arts movement, I think we also uh, have to look at the, the, the political situation itself. I do believe that what we're in right now is uh, another uh, and new civil rights movement. I do, I do feel that, that politically we're in that now. The Black Lives Matter movement is taking it to the level where it needs to go because the civil rights movement was about basic legal rights. The mm -hmm. uh, the Black Lives Matter movement is about the quintessential existential question of who has the right to humanity? Who is, 
who is human? If, uh, if we were considered uh, not human or three-fifths of a human as it, uh, as it was during slavery, then that has to be interrogated and we have to get rid of that narrative once and for all. We must have a sense of um, that all lives matter, but all lives can't matter until black lives matter. Okay? Yes. Because we are the, the quintessential um, uh, template for oppression. And so we, we, people have to understand that black lives matter just as much as anyone else and this is getting at to beyond all the legal rights that the civil rights movement brought in to the basic existential issue of humanity itself. And that's what I see in the choreography of uh, a lot of our younger artists today is that they're getting to, the, to a deeper human level uh, that needs to be unearthed, brought out, and, and the whole population able to feel on, on uh, only the way that art can do. Yes, and mm -hmm. art can do it. I'm just the next part of that sentence, <laughs> Halifu. Art can do it because people will experience art sometimes better than a person standing up and giving them a speech. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. That's people, why that the, people saw that in Intazaki's poems. That her yes, race, that's why they they were at her feet because yes. it, went, it went beyond the mind. Right. They they embodied it. They felt it deeply within their souls. And I and, think that um, actually transitions us into the into another question that we have is um, you know we're talking um, Renee was talking about people of all ages kind of bowing at her feet and yeah. Miss Diane was talking about how um, we see the the work being done by dancers of all ages now within this new movement and one of the questions that Ellen asked was um, I, what was the age of the youngest student or students that have participated in choreo poem performance technique and Miss Diane I think you were the one who spoke about integrating those things in, in your work. And I'm wondering uh, what you all might answer as the, the youngest student with whom you've worked on something that is like a choreo poem or using that technique. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, that is a very good question. Mm, I think they would be at any age. But uh, at our studio, we had, uh, we had children's classes and they experienced uh, moving just as we did as grown people learning how to improvise and connect with music and also sometimes with with words. I can only speak about um, I'm, I'm trying to think of uh, of children now definitely teenagers but I'm trying to think of children who have worked with uh, in the choreo poem Form, format. They probably are or someplace all around the country. But teens, definitely. I have seen teenagers. <laughs> Someone sent me um, uh, a video the other day of a teenager. And she was, this young lady, she was actually Caucasian. And all of the words that she was expressing, the poetry and the movement, they, she was expressing Dunham technique. Every, everything she expressed, they were all black artists. This was a young, she was a teenager who was white. This is, she has embodied this and she's expressing it in her own dance. So I, 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 this is how the arts can, it can radiate out into the in, the, in the universities, in the elementary schools, yes. I um, took Intozaki. Mm -hmm. I, I took Intozaki to see a show in. It was in Baltimore County, over here in Maryland, and mm -hmm. these middle schoolers mm -hmm. did for colored girls. Okay. So on the way, she was like, "I just know they not gonna do the adult work, the adult <laughs> language, and the adult content, and I'm gonna be upset." And I said, "How do you know?" I said, "Just wait until you get there." And she was like, I, "These are middle school children. I bet they're not gonna do it." 
So when we got to the show, full out, adult language, adult content, the N word, the whole bit. And she was, she was blown. And these kids acted. They danced, acted the whole bit. And they were middle schoolers. Now, granted, this was, a, I think this may have been a private school in Baltimore <laughs> County, but they yeah. did it. Mm. They did it. And she was, she was, um, she was very pleased with the performance. She mm. was. Mm -hmm. And they invited us purposefully just so she could have that evening and see it. And I they think she may have given some remarks after that. Yeah. Oh. Excellent. Yeah. No Thank age you. limit. No age limit on the choreo poem. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm actually smiling because I, I know that um, both Lori and Renee work with young people and I'm, I'm seeing their wheels spinning about transitioning from drums to text yeah. <laughs> as they move forward. Um, we do have a comment from one of our um, viewers tonight that just says, um, thank you for passing on the legacy of our elders. And I think particularly as we um, look at how we are working with young people and how young we can um, how, how young an artist can be when they inherit these legacies um, mm -hmm. is, is pretty remarkable. Uh, Peggy also asked, as young black and brown women read this book, what do you hope will take with them uh, to honor Intozaki's work? And I would expand that to black and brown men and women because there are both men and women who are um, celebrated within the pages of the text. Um, what do you hope that they'll take with them that honors Zaki's work? Hmm. Well, I'll, I'll start this one and mm -hmm. then I'll volley to the other ladies. Create. Be in constant motion, creating art that makes a difference. Like I heard Halifu say on, on, on one of our other calls, if Intozaki were still with us, by now she would have created several poems around George Floyd, Breonna Taylor the police brutality, the election. She had a lot to say about that, but that's for another call. And um, I want the young people to be in constant motion, constantly creating, mm -hmm. making a difference with your art and with your words, be in constant movement. And I would add that uh, in, in order to, to do that, you have to be uh, aware of what's going on in in our society. You have to stay in tune with current events. Um, you have to be aware of the, the, the narrative, the discourse that is all around us that is being played out uh, about what this country is all about. Um, what is what is the soul of America? You, you, you need to you need to be aware of these narratives that are going on all around you and then use that to create and make your voice heard in terms of where you stand within all of that. Yes. It takes, um, it, it takes courage too because, um, you know, you, you do need to be aware of what's going on, but then you have the microphone and you have to um, decide what it is that you're going to say that is going to make an impact. And, um, you know, some, I, I like to encourage the young people um, or young artists to not have that fear and have the courage to create these works. Um, the one piece that came to mind was the tap piece, uh, hell you tell them about, just hashtag say, say their name. Right. Um, very powerful piece that has been on the stage in the theater, but it's also been out on the street among the people. And they are dancing and saying their names without fear. Yeah, and, yeah. and if, if Intozaki had, had, uh, had let her fears uh, take over, she would have never even put for color girls out there because she got a lot of flack, oh, yeah. especially from men. <laughs> oh yeah, because because yeah, she yeah. was telling them about themselves, <laughs> and and um, I um, uh, when I would get um, 
uh, uh, that, that kind of criticism from uh, males that would say something about for colored girls or Intazaki, I would say the main thing you need to know about Intazaki is she was not writing about anything that she didn't know and had experienced herself. So um, uh, the, the main thing is to, to move past that fear and have the courage to speak your mind, to have your voice heard. Yes, yes. definitely. One other, add up. One other, add up. Go, go ahead, Diane. One other thing I would add, you're gonna speak about courage because mine is a different. Uh, um, no, I was just going to share a quick story of something that happened at Berea College. Um, a professor, one of the students came and the student said, my professor says he's not coming to see you because you don't like men. You hate men. And, and Tazaki said, well, that's the most absurd thing I've ever had. I've ever heard in my life. That's the most absurd thing. And then she just moved to something else. And she told me she had to hire at one point in her life, and ladies, you all can corroborate this. She told me at one point she had to hire a bodyguard. Things got so tense during the For Colored Girls time. Because mm -hmm. we're talking about the 70s. True. You yes. Know, not, not, not the 80s, 90s, the, the new millennium. They, we, we're talking about the 70s. So yes. there was a lot of things in flux, and her Black feminist voice was not always received the, uh, the way it is now. Yes. And I know it's not my place to say this, but I do wanna celebrate um, Woody King Jr. for being yes. a man who put himself out there to make sure that that work came to fruition. Uh, and he, he really went out on uh, a couple limbs for that. And it was, it was his faith in the understanding of the project. So I just wanted to raise him up. Miss Diana, yes. I don't want to step on your toes. <laughs> yes, Woody and she, and King. She got, and she got all Scott to direct mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Yes. A the man to direct it. Yes. Who got her into the public, mm -hmm. right? Like, so yes. it's, uh, yes. <laughs> Woody, Woody got her into the public. Woody, yes, I thought it was because Oz was, oh, never mind. Woody King oh, Jr. first uh, produced for Color Girls when it was when it was in New York. It was in different clubs and he brought it into the new federal theater. That was the first major production of it any place, mm -hmm. except in the mm -hmm. smaller clubs. And it was his connection with Joe Papp at the public theater that yeah, brought that. it to the public theater. So that was, uh, so Woody King, yes, Woody, yay. And, and the new federal theater, I think is celebrating its 50th anniversary. Yes, it is. Yes, they it are. is. Yes, yes, they are. Well, um, we are probably at our last question, um, and so I wanted to, um, I think there's a very sweet question that was raised in the comments. I think it's the perfect way to end um, our time together is that if, if you could say one thing to Intozaki tonight, what would it be? I, love I would you. say, we did it. <laughs> we did it. The book came to fruition. We did it, sis. We did it. <laughs> mm. So I, I don't want to be the last one to speak. So I would say, um, you know, thank you for leaving us this um, national treasure, this body of work that can be a catalyst for more work from other artists. Okay, so I guess I'd say, Zaki, we've got your back. We got oh. you. We've yeah. got your back. And in your own way, keep letting us know what you want us to do. Because we love you. Ashe. 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 That's right. I made this quilt in honor of, it was part of my uh, dissertation. And this quilt contains, it, it correlates to 10 of her poems. And I know you all can't see it real good, but this is just the basis of it. And I wanted you all to see it. It, it has a lot, of yellow and, uh, a lot of yellow and orange, which was mm -hmm. one of her favorite colors. Yeah. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I selected 10 poems and I made a, a piece for each poem. So this was it. Beautiful. And, Beautiful. and I finished it about, I finished it in September and I had been working on it for a while. And I was determined to get this done before the book came out. So, yeah. And so you've you've got some cheerleaders in the comment section for that quilt. <laughs> Definite <laughs> appreciation. Thank um, you. Uh, colleagues, I, what an honor it has been to, to spend this evening with you, to hear these stories, um, to, to get to just you know, witness these memories as they're happening and, and to get to live with you for these few moments. It has really been a joy and an honor and I cannot thank you all enough. Um, again, I, we have to thank all of our colleagues at Contemporary American Theater Festival. Um, and with that, I, I just thank you all so much for your time and your energy you. and your graciousness and your knowledge and your talent and all of the things. We, we really appreciate you. Thank you for having us. Thank, yeah. you so Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful to be with you. Yeah. And congratulations on the book. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you all.